Could you switch the slide, please, to my computer? Oh, I guess I should actually plug in. That would really help. So this is kind of one of these great, great moments where you find out what, what everybody's apps are. And not much better. There. That's what I wanted. Greetings. I'm Kazis Farnellis. I'm the director of the Network Architecture Lab, and I teach here at, uh, in the architecture program. And I welcome you to the second installment of this series that I uh, started last year called Architecture and Law. Uh, this, this installment is called Expose, Peepers, Flashers, and Other Lawbreakers. Uh, in the last series, in the last, uh, last year's event, which was also the inaugural event to uh, the series in Architecture and Law, we tackled the problem of copyright and images and what it meant uh, and what it means for architects uh, and others, uh, others in the artistic field, uh, such as artists and musicians, to deal with a, with a rapidly changing landscape of copyright. Today, we're going to be dealing with something in which perhaps, uh, and this isn't entirely clear yet, perhaps you couldn't go to jail for, perhaps you couldn't be sued for as an architect, but uh, something that you as an architect will be uh, considering, I think, more and more, which is the issues of uh, surveillance, privacy, and exposure in, again, a radically changing landscape, uh, in a radically changing cultural landscape. How does this uh, interact for both between architects and um, the architecture and the world of social media? How does uh, the world of the immaterial and the material relate in this realm? Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then I'll introduce our speakers. Uh, I will warn you that Eric Howler uh, is unable to make it. He does snowstorm took him out. He spent two hours on the plane. Uh, it was rescheduled to 5.45, and he thought that by then he would still not only not make it to today's talk, but he wouldn't make it back in time to get to uh, Munich tomorrow. So uh, unfortunately, he bowed out to our great regret. Uh, but, um, but so it goes. Um, the, the idea of of privacy and uh, is, I think, linked to our idea of selfhood and subjectivity. Uh, this is a woman uh, in this painting by Fragonard reading a, uh, a novel in the 18th century. And it's like this notion of the, 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 the subject as a whole bounded individual, as somebody who has a sense of themselves, as somebody who has an interior, a world of private thoughts, is something that to some degree is new, it is uh, relatively speaking. It's something that we can say really emerged uh, in the 18th century uh, with the, the emergence of uh, modern political and social institutions, with the rise of the novel, as many scholars have, in, have uh, investigated, uh, and also with new ideas about architecture that developed in the wake of the Enlightenment. Uh, for example, uh, what Walter Benjamin has called a bourgeois interior that is a place of one's own, a place that is yours, that is not anyone else's, a place to which you have rights, perhaps rights to privacy, something that people always seem to think they have, even if it may not, generally speaking, at least in this country, be encoded in law, uh, but it's something that uh, seems to already be given uh, to individuals. And yet, with this right to, pri to the pub private, there is also a certain right to the public, a right to a world um, of uh, the street, a world where you see others, a world where you interact with other private individuals in a different space. Um, and for all of the, the, the great things that this created, it also came along with certain ideas of power, ideas of surveillance. Uh, certainly, Haussmann's boulevards were not only uh, great places of public display, they were also uh, places uh, that were, spaces that were designed to uh, allow uh, armies to be marched down, spaces that were designed to be surveyed, spaces that 
as Michel Foucault tells us, uh, that acted panopticonally, uh, spaces that uh, sur allowed surveillance to happen. And so the, the great uh, 19th century city, of course, is as much a product of this bourgeois revolution and the creation of the, the notion of the public and the private. It's also a, uh, so a, a world that is marked by the rise of surveillance, a world that's, that's marked by a certain kinds of intrusiveness into our lives. And yet, what of today? What of our own world? A world where we no longer inhabit one space, where we inhabit multiple spaces at once, where uh, our most private thoughts may be given up in the most public of spaces. Um, a world in which, conversely, public events seem to also uh, take place in private. A world in which we have a kind of a blurring of these conditions. Uh, Gilles Deleuze has talked about, in his postscript to the Societies of Control, has talked about the emergence of a world of modulations in place of a world of, um, of, uh, of discrete spaces, of, con of enclosures. Uh, what, what sort of rights do we have in this, in, this, uh, in this space? And what does this have to do with architecture? Uh, because it's clear that the landscape is changing greatly. And if the man who ran the CIA, General Petraeus, right, uh, that was busted because of his Gmail account, and these are the computers, perhaps a little bit more physical in this sense, uh, his comput the computers for Paula Brad Bradwell's, from Paula Bradwell's house, uh, he, she was Petraeus' mistress, being seized and taken away. If Petraeus himself, the, the, the head of the CIA, couldn't figure this out, if he couldn't figure out how to stay private, and he was undone by Gmail, then what hope do we have? Um, with this in mind, uh, a conflation of, uh, or two, a, two of the speakers uh, in this panel and myself were involved in a project. Uh, we produced a pamphlet uh, for, uh, that is Helen Nissenbaum and myself uh, mutually interviewed each other and recorded our, our online, in fact, uh, discussion, our email-based discussion in a pamphlet uh, called Modulated Cities, Networked Spaces, and Reconstituted Subjects. Uh, we published this last year. Uh, it was for uh, the Situated Technologies pamphlet series that was produced by, uh, among others, Mark Shepard, who's another one of our speakers today. Uh, and uh, it was published by the Architectural League of New York. You may all download it for free uh, for, or from the League's website or purchase it off of Lulu. And uh, here we, we address some of these issues, uh, Helen and I, who didn't know each other. In fact, this is only the second time we've ever been in the same room together, strangely enough. Um, and having already completed this book, uh, and we, we, came to, we came to understand just how thorny these issues are, if anything else, rather than coming to any conclusions. And more recently, another, another uh, event has happened that, that I was surprised by. In, in looking for uh, the images by the photographer Michael Wolf, whose, uh, whose, cover, uh, whose photograph graces our cover, um, I, was, I noticed that uh, there's now potential lawsuits against him. And the reason is because after he did this series of uh, works on uh, transparency in the city, looking at, diff at the way that uh, buildings such as in this case, obviously 86880 by Ms. van der Rohe, uh, were, uh, how, how people inhabit these buildings and how we can see into them and what it, this might mean, he has begun to take on a new set of uh, detailed, detailed uh, photographs of the individuals through those very windows. And now there were some suggestions in some uh, online that he could be very well, very likely liable for, uh, for a lawsuit because of invasion of privacy. But what does this mean? What does it mean for a photographer to take a photograph of a building, of activities in a building? Is, it, is this an invasion of privacy in a world of modulations? Does, or, or not, when we know that our, uh, our own purchasing habits, our uh, beha online behaviors, especially in Gmail, of course, uh, are all being tracked, all being targeted, all being researched by corporations, as well as by the military and the, and the government. Uh, this is uh, a famous room in a building owned by AT&T in San Francisco, room 641A. Nobody knows what goes on precisely in there. However, this is a data center. 
and uh, pretty much all of AT&T's traffic on the West Coast flows through here, and that room is reputed to just take note of everything. Suppose these NSA controls this room, and they just monitor everything. And this, all this information, together with, with other um, information that is being gathered by various government agencies, is gathered in, in uh, spaces called fusion centers. These are spaces, and they're remarkably like uh, the, uh, the control room that, uh, that IBM has uh, in Rio, that the smart cities control. But they're a little bit different, and they're dedicated towards control, towards finding out just what, just what threats are out there. Uh, we live in a world of drones, and to think that you know, just 10 years ago, uh, what transformations uh, have happened, drones that are now being deployed not just uh, overseas, but are also being deployed uh, here in, in, uh, in American cities for the purpose of uh, surveillance of possible uh, troublemakers. But perhaps we have our own responses. Uh, we can make our own drones, and now we have a DIY drone movement. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps there will soon be a fleet of GSAP drones. Perhaps that should be our next request on, on the budget. Uh, or, or DNA. You know, this is. I'm sure I'm completely revealing my uh, something I shouldn't about myself, but I have no idea what this means. This is a bit of my genome, and we can sequence this for $99. You can sequence your genome and put it up on the screen in, in wood if you want. Um, so, <laughs> you know. So, what does this mean? Perhaps. Um, and what does it mean to, uh, with regards to architecture? Uh, a place of, of solidity, a place of safe spaces, a place that you can feel enclosed in. Uh, you can feel like you're okay, like nobody is, uh, nobody's watching in here, perhaps, from outside. And yet, you know, perhaps they are. Again, you know, how are they doing this electronically? How are they doing that? How can people survey our behaviors, your, your Twitter feed, your, your, mess, your G chat, um, and so on? Uh, and does architecture still have a role in this? A, a few, and, and what complications does this have to architecture? Because if we go back to that uh, first slide, to that woman reading the novel, and we think of the kind of the enclosure she was reading in, and that kind of private space, and we're now in a world in which things have changed radically, how does that change architecture too, and our own response to this? And I think of um, there was an article called Yours for the Peeping uh, in, in the New York Times about four or five years ago that talked about the architecture um, of, the, uh, of, the, of Chelsea near the High Line and the kind of the displays of individuals within it, uh, the, the way that people take their clothes off at the standard hotel. And you can see, you know, there's the bathtub. It seems to be designed to, you know, you don't want to close that curtain, but then if you don't, you know. And uh, what's going to happen? Well, originally you would have, uh, if somebody took a snapshot of you on your, their iPhone and, and uploaded, uh, the standard would have been glad to upload it to their blog. They kind of quickly decided not to. But, you know, what does it mean that we're, we're changing? Are we changing? Are we changing in the way we, we think about architecture and about, you know, do the, does Edith Farnsworth, who reputedly was very unhappy with being watched, unlike perhaps Philip Johnson, who liked to be watched, uh, <laughs> And uh, would she feel differently today? Um, would she? And in fact, the, the, the amazing thing to me, and, and perhaps a little bit disturbing, was that then they, uh, that they were mentioning one building in Chelsea, not the standard, but another one, and they, uh, that, and they asked the architect who, uh, why, they, why the facade was so transparent, why, and, and why they thought that not only was the facade, there, did they make such a transparent facade, but did the individuals within it reveal themselves so much? It was, it was notorious as a place where people like to you know, hang out with their, um, right in front of the windows. And, and, this, and this, this, this architect responded, well, I think this is a kind of Facebook architecture. And, and to my surprise, this was actually one of my students from a few years beforehand. Uh, and so I think that they were already up to, know, knew more about this than I did, um, as is usually the case. So with that in mind, I just wanted to lay out uh, these brief parameters for today's talks. That is that we live in a, in a rapidly changing world from enclosures to modulations, and yet, and yet the architecture is important, and yet that's why we're here. And how, but how will these things, how will architecture and the, the immaterial interact? How will they uh, continue to modulate further, if you will, and how will privacy publicity, publicness, exposure, voyeurism, all relate. So with that in mind, I'm going to introduce our speakers, and in the order that they will speak in, 
Uh, we're going to begin with uh, Beatrice Colomina, who is a uh, professor of history and theory at Princeton, director of graduate studies at the PhD program, um, also the director of the program in media and modernity. She's the author, of course, of, of Privacy and Publicity, Modern Architecture as Mass Media, which is the authoritative text on this. We're very glad you came. Uh, as well as uh, Domesticity at War, and has published a whole series of other books uh, that are familiar to all of you, I'm sure, Clip Stamp Fold, Sexuality in Space, Cold War Hot Houses, and, and, uh, and others. So Beatrice will start us off. Afterwards, we will turn, I think, to Helen, if that's all right. Um, and uh, Helen is a professor uh, in, uh, Helen Nissenbaum is a professor at New York University, and she's the director of the Information Law Institute, uh, and you're in the program of Media, Culture, and communi Communication and Computer Science? Department. Department. Oh. Okay, Department of Media, Culture. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm terrible about such things. Uh, and she's published uh, Privacy in Context, which is a uh, subtitle Technology, Policy, and in the Integrity of Social Life. Um, as well as uh, co-edited a book uh, on a, a, the Academy and the Internet, um, and uh, also compute, um, computers, ethics, and social values, correct? So, uh, and then Mark Shepard is uh, the final one. Mark is an interesting character because we sat next to each other in first year design uh, in architecture at Cornell. So he went to Cornell, but he also is, our, is a alum of GSAP, uh, where he went to the AAD program, uh, and is now, and uh, Mark is now an associate professor at the university at Buffalo, and uh, he holds a joint appointment in both the departments of architecture and media study, uh, where he also com uh, coordinates the media, uh, architecture, and computing MR MFA dual degree program. Um, Mark, as well, is, a, uh, is an artist, architect, and researcher. And his work, uh, his work well, you'll see, very specifically addresses this material. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, was very much involved with this long-standing project at the Architectural League uh, that began as uh, architecture and situated technologies in 2006 as a kind of symposium, and then became toward the sentient city an exhibit that included uh, included uh, among others uh, uh, GSAP faculty uh, to exploring the evolving relationship between ubiquitous computing, architecture, and urban space, and then also uh, this has led to also to a book called uh, The Sentient City, Ubiquitous Computing Architecture in the Future of Urban Space, uh, which was published by MIT. So um, with that in mind, those are our speakers. That's our plan. And then afterwards, we will talk about this. All right? So. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to to be here with all of you to discuss these uh, really important issues. What does this have to do with architecture? Because it keeps repeating this question, and of course the answer is it has everything uh, to do with architecture. Architecture is always about what is private, and what is public, what is inside, and what is outside, and this incredible uh, convolution of boundaries uh, between inside and outside didn't start, of course, with the internet, because he's referred to privacy and publicity, a book that I wrote basically in this building, because it was my my um, dissertation. But of course, it was the 80s. There was no internet, right? So why was I thinking about right? And in fact, I think in thinking about um, uh, the ever shifting boundaries of uh, private and um, public space, it is crucial uh, to understand that architecture itself is inseparable from technologies of, communi of communication. In fact, this is practically, I can say that this has been the obsession of everything I have uh, done. Uh, to give you a very quick uh, uh, um, view of this, uh, of the way in which I have addressed this issue, I have tried to demonstrate, for example, that uh, uh, the horizontal window of Le Corbusier is uh, unthinkable without thinking about uh, film. Right? And not only because Le Corbusier thought that film was the most appropriate uh, medium to represent modern architecture, but because the window itself, which one has to understand how polemical it was and how Perret wrote this whole article in the most important newspaper of Paris at the time accusing 
Le Corbusier, that his architecture was not architecture at all. And when you read uh, the argument, very, very soon he focuses not in the absence of ornament, not in this, not in that, but precisely on the horizontal window. The, the scene is the horizontal window, which unlike the port fenet, doesn't offer you a perspectival view of the world. Now you have a view that is uh, flat, uh, that has become like a screen uh, stuck to, to your window. Likewise, I think you can argue uh, that you cannot think about the uh, Eames house without thinking about the, the invention of, uh, of the color slide. And again, not so much because that's the way in which they decided to represent uh, their house with these films that are made entirely, there's no camera movement, that they are entirely made of, uh, of the slides they have taken uh, over the course of their first five years of living in this house. Not only they are slides, they will leave Coda instamatic to everybody, to their kids, to the employees, etc. Everybody could take a, a picture. All of a sudden, we have gone from the canonic uh, few images of modern architecture taken by a professional photographer to everybody uh, can take an image. Well, what I'm trying to say is not because the film is represented, uh, the, the film that represents the house is made uh, with a slice that I think you cannot think about the house without thinking about the color slide, but because the vision that the house itself makes possible is unthinkable outside the kaleidoscopic uh, uh, view that the multiplication of uh, instamatic cameras and color slides make possible. Likewise, and, uh, again, the Eames house, going now to the typical house uh, at mid-century with their picture window, we can as well argue that uh, you cannot think about this uh, picture window without thinking about television. In each uh, case, uh, um, the ambitions, let's say, of modern architecture to dissolve, this ambition that is from the beginning of the century, to dissolve the line between inside and outside is realized precisely by absorbing the latest realities of communication. So if communication is basically all about uh, bringing the outside in, as for example, when you read a newspaper, trying to bring events into your life, or when you send a letter, and I deliberately um, referring to all media, and perhaps it's not an accident that these advertisements of Pella uh, windows, the Pella of the 50s, is precisely a mailman that is uh, behind um, this picture window with these little kind of girls and their the twins and their and their uh, dolls uh, there, a little bit creepy if you, if you want. Well, the important thing to understand here is that in architecture, glass eh, represents this act of communication. It, and it's, it's almost as if uh, a glass takes over more and more of the building as systems of communica communication become more fluid throughout the uh, uh, century. Well, my current... Uh, interest in uh, this uh, phenomena, well, my current, I mean, maybe it's now <laughs> 30 years of an obsession, but never mind. I think, in a way, um, renew precisely by, new, uh, by the new reality of our times, right? But um, this is uh, actually my first obsession in New York, the thing that I wanted to do for my dissertation, and my advisor say, oh, this has nothing to do with architecture, so I ended up doing Law and Le Corbusier and, and, and all of these things that sounded more, uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, so my current interest, as I say, is this question of the relationship between transparency in modern architecture and uh, the medical technologies of imaging uh, the body. From that point of view, uh, the logic of uh, sheer uh, glass is exactly that of the X-ray. The inner structure is revealed by a new technology that allows us uh, to look through the outer skin of the body. Mies even uh, described um, his own uh, work as a skin and bones uh, architecture and referred to, this, uh, to the structure of his glass skyscraper of 1922 as the skeleton. And as you can see, he renders it as if, uh, if it was, the project was seen under an X-ray uh, machine. Of course, now you're looking at the image, they, they will probably say, yeah, it's obvious. It looks like an X-ray machine, but then you may want to ask why it took more than a century for a historian to point out that the building looks like an X-ray, right? And it's not that we didn't have clues in the archives. Mies, like many of those architects of that, that period, were completely obsessed 
with X-rays, mis uh, collected X-rays and published it in his work, in his magazine uh, Gay, in case you thought there was no relationship between such things. But Mies, of course, is not alone. Uh, books on modern architecture are completely filled with uh, images of glowing uh, glass skins revealing inner bones and organs. Think, for example, about the Corbusier project for the glass skyscraper of 1925. Think about Walter Gropius, Bourbon exhibition in Cologne uh, of 1914, situated by many authors at the beginning of modern architecture, but they immediately focus precisely on the corner and on the fact that you can see through it. That's what caused uh, such surprise in 1914. You can think about Eric Mendelssohn, second department story in Stuttgart of 1926. You can think about Poet's uh, Glass Palace in the Netherlands of 1935, and here it's at night. You can think about George Keck uh, Glass House with, uh, in the 1933 fair in Chicago with the Bucky Fuller uh, car park in the, in the garage. Or you can think about Miss uh, uh, project for the, um, for the glass house in the hillside of 1934 or Bucky Fuller, Diamaxion Tower, and so many other projects that I'm sure now are kind of clicking in your, in your head. They are all, they are all like x-rays. So, but if this uh, kind of experimental designs from the early decades of the 20th century, uh, and they were mostly not realized, impossible to realize, Miss had no idea how to do a glass skyscraper in 1926, uh, by uh, mid-century, you have the complete uh, uh, glass house. The glass house becomes like a mass uh, phenomena uh, in projects such as, of course, Philip Johnson glass house or the Farnsworth house of Miss Van der Rohe, but also, of course, uh, in the typical suburban house uh, with the picture uh, window. And this happens exactly at the same time that the X-ray itself becomes a mass phenomena. So if the X-ray had been used uh, since the beginning of the century as a diagnosis for uh, people already showing symptoms of, the, uh, of tuberculosis, uh, at this point, everybody is X-ray. And in fact, uh, in popular culture, you have this already this association of the X-ray uh, with glass houses. Also, you have in popular culture this thing I love, which is the idea that you will not only give your, uh, your photographs to your boyfriend to talk with all my love, but also the X-ray, so you are not only this kind of healthy <laughs> uh, uh, girl, but you are also uh, 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 clean uh, inside. In, uh, in a film done by Kodak in 1937, which is trying to convince people uh, to have X-rays, and this is interesting, people were afraid of the X-rays for the same reason that now people are afraid of the, of the machines in the airports, because they uh, reveal your privacy, not because of the radiation. They didn't know anything about the radiation, exactly like na right now. The other day I read that these machines actually are really dangerous, that we shouldn't be passing by those machines. In, not pass by those machines. In Europe, they have already outlawed them. <laughs> Particularly all of us uh, frequent flyers, we shouldn't be doing this at all. But all the debates on the papers for the last, what, five years have been all about how you can see everything. Okay. I'd rather they see everything, but they don't give me cancer. But the interesting thing is that we are still in the same situation. So in 1937, Kodak has to produce this film to convince people uh, that uh, of the virtues of the X-ray. And you see this woman wearing this swimming suit that is uh, shown strapped to the laboratory table, while her body is X-ray. And, uh, and then as the X-ray uh, as the body of the woman gives way to the X-ray, uh, the narrator, which is a man, of course, says, this young lady to whom henceforth a glass house will hold no terror will, after an examination of her radiographs, be reassured that she indeed is physically fit. So what is wrong with this sentence? It's not that this young lady, after an examination of her, of her X-rays, will be reassured that she's physically fit. But this young lady, after seeing her X-ray, will no longer be afraid, will not have terror, terror, living in a glass house. So actually the association between uh, the glass house and the X-ray is clearly established uh, here. The glass house is a symbol of, um, of both a new form of surveillance and of health. In case you think this is some weird thing of popular culture, exactly the same set of associations can be seen in the discourse around 
canonic works of modern architecture, as for example in this interview in House Beautiful, Edith Franswell, who of course is a very successful uh, doctor in Chicago, compare her house, the famous uh, house that Miss uh, have done for her, uh, the Farnsworth house, a weekend uh, house, she compares it to an X-ray and goes on to say that there is a local rumor that the house is a tuberculosis uh, sanatorium. So she goes on and on about how, uh, you know, you can see the kitchen from the road, but it's not that you can see the kitchen, of course, you can see absolutely uh, everything. Look at the, at the, at the bedroom. In any case, the development of the X-rays and of uh, modern architecture coincide. Just as the X-ray exposes the inside of the body to the public eye, the modern building decides to expose its interior. That which was previously private is now subjected to public scrutiny. The threshold of the private, then, is no longer uh, the outside limit of a building. It has been uh, relocated. Privacy is now paradoxically established uh, in public, something that is all too obvious today with the use, for example, of cell phone to create kind of an intimate uh, space in the heart of, uh, of a public space or in the opposite direction, projecting the most intimate details of one's life to a wider and wider audience uh, through uh, social media. Uh, in a sense, uh, Kodak already understood uh, uh, this new uh, paradigm. There was nothing to fear in X-rays or in glass houses. That's the message of this film. The X-ray had acclimatized us to living in glass houses, as it were. The most uh, intimate uh, or the most inner secrets of our bodies or, or of our domestic uh, life are now uh, floating uh, in public. But what uh, is happening to the outside side of the building when private and public uh, get uh, confused? And I think then perhaps we can jump uh, to a more recent uh, case. Uh, I was struck by what you present, Cathy's, because of course in the 50s already uh, Lakeshore Drive um, is photographed in Life magazine and nobody, nobody has curtains. It's, it's extraordinary, you can see in great detail through the windows, how uh, all the things that are, and of course the fact that there were two twin towers, no one becoming kind of the audience for the other, make the whole uh, project of, of me like a kind of multiplex, right? With, uh, with <laughs> kind of uh, 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 performing uh, for each other in ways that are very uh, contemporary, and nobody, nobody seemed to be upset about it. Then, 1950, so we're still, it's striking to me that people still in the press talk about the standard as, uh, as this great thing. We have had this kind of architecture for a long time. So let's look what is happening in the horizon, what new things may be happening that are no longer uh, uh, in that paradigm. Because I think having dissolved the walls with uh, glass, the question has become now how to dissolve glass itself, the last, if you want, delicate line between inside and outside. The relentless quest for a fluidity between inside and outside is no longer simple, simply a drive towards transparency. The glass box has become something else. Think about, for example, uh, the work of, uh, of Sana, uh, Novartis, uh, uh, here. Sana's uh, Toledo's uh, museum and her work in general is a symptom of this uh, development. At first, if you look at the Toledo Museum, you seem like uh, you think seem to think you think that is the perfect example of transparency, an all glass pavilion for all glass objects in the glass uh, city of Toledo. And in that sense, Miss has written about uh, uh, Sana has been written about as the inheritor of Misian tradi tradition of radical uh, transparency. In the standard uh, publicity image of the project, the white trim. Uh, pavilion sits on a park, clearly uh, echoing um, some of these canonic uh, projects, such as the Farnsworth House, or even more, uh, the 50 by 50 uh, house. But Sana's uh, vision is far from crystal clear. The glass pavilion seems to be much more about a blurring of, uh, of, uh, of the view, a softening of the focus, if you want, than about the transparency of the early uh, avant-garde. The real view is not uh, from the outside looking in or the inside looking out, but the inside looking even farther inward, not to discover the inner secrets of the building, but to be suspended in the view itself. 
is in that in that sense symptomatic that in Sejima's world you never see the structure. The structure is not revealed. Her buildings are not even uh, structures you look into or out of. They are optical devices without kind of visible mechanism. In Toledo, the visitor is literally suspended between these uh, curving uh, walls of glass. What you see through the glass uh, layer in front of you is another layer and then another another one. This is the, the plan, of course, just to demonstrate that what is exposed is actually the walls uh, themselves, the inner and outer uh, edges of the glass, the gap between them, which is, is this inaccess an inaccessible uh, uh, space of the wall itself that is now being uh, revealed. Looking through the layers, uh, the vision is often and distorted, with the curves accentuating this distortion. Isejima is the inheritor of mission transparency, as so many criti critics insist. The latest, I will say, in a long line of follower. I will say that she is the ultimate mission, jumping right out of the line by going beyond transparency into a whole new kind of mirage effect. So, uh, after centuries of architecture organized by the straight lines of the viewing eye, now we have an architecture formed by the soft distortions of the gaze, a kind of more tactile experience of vision. To enter a Sejima project is kind of to be caressed by the subtle softening of the territory. Even the reflections of the trees in the outer layer of the glass have a softness that you never find in mist, whether it is in the renderings or in the full size uh, uh, project. X-ray is cutting uh, through the outer layers to reveal secrets give way in her world to, in their world to inner layers endlessly folded and overlapping fabrics that intensify the mystery rather than remove it. The X-ray logic absorbed by modern architecture culminates in a dense uh, cloud of ghostly uh, shapes. Today, of course, uh, there are new forms of uh, advanced surveillance uh, technologies that are operating in the city that you can say that those are new models of vision that can act as a new paradigm uh, for the window. We cannot predict which ones of these technologies will be absorbed in architecture, but some already are impacting, of course, uh, the built environment. And again, uh, what interested, interested me here is that they seem to produce, again, a kind of blur, the, blur, the kind of blur that Sejim uh, worked so hard to produce also in the renderings, which is where you really understand what she's aspiring to rather than the transparency that so much is insisted. Handheld scanning devices are capable of now seeing through clothing, walls, and buildings, and are used by the military and also by the police, and effectively making solid walls act like glass. For one looking infrared radar, FLIR, for example, which is actually thermal imaging, is one of these technologies. It is based on the electronic frequencies at which heat radiates from organisms and structure. Seemingly solid walls no longer offer privacy. Indeed, the scan may reveal activities that have already finished. You can be exposed even after you have left because the heat signature uh, remains for a while. I, li I like this idea of the, of the delay. No? Another tool has become, as I said before, uh, really uh, 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 popular today in the press. They're always talking about this, this question, passing millimeter imaging, which is used in the US customs to detect hidden weapons in contraband uh, clothing, bags, or vehicles. And it's obviously as, it is the, uh, as if the outer layer uh, is stripped away. With the Kaya uh, lens, which is illegal in the United States and in Europe, but available through the internet, anyone can use a regular camera, even a cell phone camera, to see through clothing by concentrated on the infrared uh, spectrum. These are all, all technologies. I think this was already uh, five years ago, caused a, a huge uh, uh, horror in, in Tokyo when people were going with the our cameras. They have to establish <laughs> cars for my, women and, and men, etc. The mid-century loss, uh, fear of the loss of privacy in glass houses and with the X-ray has, in a way, uh, reappeared. It is as if each new technology that exposes something private uh, is threatening and then absorbed into everyday life and we forget about it. So the fear of glass uh, boxes or glass houses or even of X-ray seems to us quaint uh, today. 
even the grainy kind of uh, images of uh, video surveillance cameras seems almost uh, uh, already, sorry, less invasive now, almost reassuring. Perhaps today's uh, scanning technologies will almost seem quaint in the future, since each new technology goes deeper and deeper into the private, the definition of private changes in response to every uh, new invasion. Privacy is increasingly defined by a kind of blur uh, within a hyper-public uh, space. The intentional blurring of the airport PMI scan is supposed to protect those worried about the loss of privacy, but privacy is no longer defined by a line. Privacy is established by a blurring between the most public space, and maybe you can hide for a while between that blur. So returning to the question of what is the role of the sign, what the role of the sign might be in hyper-public uh, space, this blur may be treated as a kind of tactical operation, a kind of a space, a new kind of interior that can be uh, designed. So in conclusion, in changing our definitions of public and private, the new uh, surveillance technologies, like the technologies that emerged in the early 20th century change our understanding of architecture. And what we don't know yet is what architecture will come out of these new uh, technologies. Thank you very much. like this picture. <laughs> it's too distracting. But uh, I wouldn't mind the lights coming on. Is that possible? Can we have the lights? I, do, I don't have slides and I would love to see people. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for inviting me here, Kazis. Um, <clears throat> I just have to add a little bit to my biography. I'm not an architect. I'm a philosopher by training and an analytic philosopher. I run, um, I'm in the media culture and communication department and I run the information law, uh, law institute at the law school and we have a weekly meeting called the privacy research group and a lot of my work's been in that area and I have to say that many of the students and colleagues in my department know of Kazis's work and when they heard that I was writing with him, they were, they were shocked with disbelief. How, <laughs> how are, is someone who talks about Deleuze, who understands Deleuze, going to work with me, who's you know, died in the world, analytic philosopher, interested in policy and law and such matters. But it was, it was really a wonderful experience. This is the book. And um, we, we didn't agree on everything, but... Um, I learned a great deal about my own thinking as well as, as what Kazes presented. Now, <clears throat> this work was an exploration of um, networked space and shifting boundaries and, in fact, sort of the absence of boundaries and, and other ways that society gets modulated and um, the impact on the private and the public. And I want to say right away that um, I, I don't see privacy as the opposite of publicity. So we could say private and public, and that's a dichotomy. But I like to reserve the word privacy or the term privacy for something that, <clears throat> that is normative. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that today. Now, in, <clears throat> in this dialogue that we published, um, it, we ranged over a number of topics in the philosophy of technology and privacy, many of them um, have drawn my attention for many years in my writing and um, in my research. And this evening I'm going to spend a, a bit of time on them. Um, and when I first saw the title of the event, Peepers, Flashes and Other Lawbreakers, I have to say I was a little bit dismayed and Kaziz can uh, tell you that I emailed him and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say? What do I know about Peepers, Flashes and Other Lawbreakers? Not more than the average individual and possibly less, but he assured me that there was no need to take it literally, and I have not taken it literally, but in fact I, I retained the provocation of it, and eventually um, I found that there really was a connection between what I wanted to say today and at least part of the ti title. Now, um, 
Among the subjects of keenest interest and difficulty, I think, in these areas of philosophy of technology and information technology, digital media, and so on, is the relation of the built environment on the one hand, and on the other, an amalgam of culture, ethics, power, and politics. And I think that Beatrice's uh, talk really um, did a great job of, of getting us there, particularly at the end. And I'm saying built environment because I'm really excited to be speaking in a school of architecture. And while normally I would just talk about technology, digital media, software systems, I hope to find some commonality with architects and designers in some of these thoughts. And of course, um, I talk a lot about things like um, policy and, and ethics and politics, but at the same time, if you think about the fact that law should embody some of these principles, some of these values, some, some ethics and so on, um, oftentimes I find myself working with people in the area of law and technology, law, privacy, and asking questions not about what is the law, and I've had to learn a lot of that, but also questions about what the law should do. Now, in my work on privacy, and this as a little bit of background, and it's explored in my book on privacy and context, I conceive of the challenge of privacy um, in these terms. Our private our expectations of privacy, our privacy expectations, and this is what's at the crux, crux of my concern, are formed by our judgments of what flows of personal information are appropriate. Now here, um, I know we're, we're in a school of architecture, we're thinking a lot about buildings and spaces, um, but I would say most of my own work has to do with um, access to information, personal information, and information flow. Now sometimes when we talk about visibility, we're talking about ac visib visual access to information. So there's an overlap, but, the, but uh, there's only an inter it's, it's not a complete overlap. Now, in, this, in the, this way of defining privacy as appropriate flow of information differs from what uh, many other people, the way many other people think about privacy. They think about privacy as secrecy, as simply about the restriction of information, or about privacy as control, as the control, as say a right to control information about ourselves. And the reason I want to um, emphasize this difference between how I think about privacy and how many others think about privacy, and in fact, a lot of this is embedded is in the law, is that I want to distinguish between um, the release of information, and here, if we compare, say, glass houses, exposure and visibility, to re the, the diminishment of privacy. We can give information, we can share information, we can um, reveal information without diminishing privacy if that information is shared and revealed and so on in ways that we consider appropriate. And the theory of contextual integrity, privacy of contextual, as contextual integrity, talks about a appropriate flow of information uh, and appropriate appropriateness is um, in relation to specific contexts, which may be co the context of friendship or family or healthcare, education, um, spirituality, and, and in particular one of the most important ones is in our relationship as citizens to government. Now along comes, so we have these settled notions of what the appropriate flows of information are in these various social contexts. And along comes technology, and uh, we've heard a lot about them already in the various presentations, huge arrays of network systems, uh, video surveillance, RFIDs, data storage and analytics, um, drones, TSA body scanners, um, and so on. It's Google Maps Street View, um, on and on, tracking on the web, um, um, and we experience these disruptions as violations of privacy. These are disruptions in the flow of information, 
uh, or at least prima facie we experience them as violations of privacy unless we're convinced that the disruptive flows and practices are in some ways better than the ones better than the ones that were entrenched. And I'll say more about what this means in a little while. Now the status quo is familiar and I'm, I'm now feeling humbled as I'm about to say the next things. Our walls are opaque. We can hang drapes over our windows, we can close our doors, we can send sealed letters and so on. But IT, as we've seen, and these technologies that we've heard about, and many of you I'm sure have read about now in front page newspapers, they change all this. We throng to social networks, we tweet, our click streams are monitored, governments can amass huge amounts of data, they can literally, as we see, uh, as we heard, see through our walls with thermal in imaging devices, and they can identify us on the streets with biometric technologies such as facial recognition. Now the question this raises is with, and, and here's what I think are the most uh, difficult questions. Whether the technologies, these technologies, are responsible for the cultural disruptions, or whether there even are cultural or ethical dis disruptions that technology causes. And I've argued that, that there are, that there are values in, de in design, in, in technology, but what I'm unsure about, or at least I have theories about it, but I think it's to the heart of one of the most difficult questions, is where does the cycle of change take place? Where and with whom does do these changes originate? Why are we doing this? Why, are we ha why do we experience these technologies, these thermal imaging devices, these, these fascinations with x-rays and glass walls? Now, I've argued that technology, or let's, you can say, built, system, built systems can hijack polit politics, a view that Langdon Winner and many other philosophers of technology have supported. That is, that it is important and worthwhile to pay heed to the discordance between what we hold to be right and wrong, appropriate and inappropriate, and what the material world can do. Or maybe, maybe they're actually in accord, but uh, most intriguing are when they seem to be discordant. Now, I've assumed that there's a lesson here for designers, and in some of my own work, we have something called the PRG Lab, and um, we, we do some DIY privacy projects, and it's really interesting, Beatrice, because one of the particular approaches to protecting privacy that I and various students and colleagues have been, become interested in is not so much blurring, but obfuscation. So it's protecting privacy not by diminishing information, but by putting out so much information that you obfuscate what's underneath there. But I've assumed that it is the, that designers can take a stand on, on, on um, shoring up certain fragile value, values commitments. And as such, the designers, the architects, the builders have important work to do um, in supporting certain political commitments. So those of us who see this connection believe that conscientious designers and architects might even take these impacts into consideration in the work. A round table or a rectangle one, a rectangular one, uh, is it going to be transparent glass or translucent and so on, so that these decisions are, are, are value and political decisions from the get-go. But there are other views, and this is where I think Kaziz, I think Kaziz and I disagreed with one another to a degree. So what are the disagreements with this uh, eminently um, I think, believable position to hold, which is that um, we need to be activists in design and that we can be, we can take positions on, in design that are political decisions. Now, one um, other view is that the environment does not act in political ways, but is a pure, already a reflection of social, political, and cultural change that has already taken place. And in, in the words of the title of this event, we could say something like, we are already peepers and flashers. So technology is not making us so. And the other view 
is that humans, humans, humans and human societies, cultures, values, ethics are infinitely malleable. That the designer, the corporate entrepreneur in many cases, in the ones mainly that I study, Google, Facebook, or perhaps the visionary architect, can shape these, you know, culture, value, and so forth through the design. That surveillance and social media actually alters our values. We become, so, so here now taking the title of this, it's not that we were already flashes and peepers, but we can become flashes and peepers through those designers. Through we, we are eminently valuable. Now, I disagree with with both of these, um, and so uh, so if, so. For example, uh, we those of us in this field spend a lot of time thinking about Facebook for a whole variety of reasons. But Google and so forth; those are the big the companies that are capturing a lot of information about us and, and, um, and making it available to others. So we see, um, if, we, if we would see Facebook as a mere manifestation of what our societies already see as new and acceptable behaviors or appropriate flows, and this is what Mark Zuckerberg has, would like us to believe, I think we're failing to appreciate that, first of all, different people, different individuals, different parties, have different interests, have, have vastly different interests in, and in the outcome, vested interests, and design or the artifact can have a huge impact in reordering power and authority. And so it's not as if we have this unitary culture and then design can kind of shape it all in one. It's that if you're a weakling, then the discovery of the lever was great for you because suddenly it wasn't the muscle guy who ran society, but you know, you're the, you're the nerd and, and you could now rise to the top of the heap. So there are many ways in which, society, in which technology doesn't serve us all equally. And the second consideration is that actually what we bring, what, we've, what we make happen through te technological systems often is what, what people think the technology is doing. Let me, let me um, backtrack on that. It's often very different from the, the reality. And so our actions, that the actions we take, which maybe look as if we're embracing that technology um, and re that the technology reflects us, is built on a, f on a fiction, on mistaken beliefs. And again, take Facebook. Um, many, and, and I'm sure that many of you are Facebook users, and I'm sure you've been following all the discussion about the, the changing um, privacy settings, and you may think that the latest iteration of the privacy settings in which Facebook now allows you to name um, some intimate friends that you can, and, and you can share intimate information with these friends and withhold it from others, you may say, this is very pro-privacy, this is really great. And, we met, I met some of the lawyers who are helping devices, but the first thing, call me cynical, I think to myself is, the better the privacy settings, the more you're gonna write in your Facebook profile and the more information Facebook will have about you. But how many people are thinking about that? I don't think very many. Another example that is, is, uh, that's been ongoing at the moment is this initiative for, uh, for, for browsers on the web to express their preference not to be tracked through uh, something called do not track. And the, the big debate is how, what, what does do not track mean? And when you ask people what do not track mean, it's, of course like on the face of it, 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 it might mean to you, oh no, you won't be tracking me when I surf the web. And the answer is absolutely not. You will be tracked, you just may not be shown targeted ads. So there's a way in which we may appear to embrace when in fact we aren't. Now the other, the other uh, concern I mentioned, which is um, the malleability, the fact that we're very malleable and we're simply waiting for visionary designers to push us to the next um, layer of, of values and politics and so on. I, I, I'd like to disagree and, and maybe we all really share this view. I don't think that humans may be able to survive many things, but I don't think we can um, normalize to anything. And 
for instance, we can live under tyrannical rule, uh, and we've seen this, but there's always this move to want uh, autonomy and, and freedom and so forth. But, but, the, but what I want to emphasize about privacy in particular, and this I fear uh, costs privacy in a bad life, is that privacy, and we, there is that beautiful picture of the girl reading, privacy is not about the individual only. Privacy, as appropriate flow of information, sustains social life in many crucial ways. Social contexts, these different social contexts or realms like friendship and home life, healthcare, education, political citizenship, spirituality, and, and so forth, those, the, the, the health of these realms maintains healthy society and simplifies our lives to enable a good quality of existence and coexistence. Now, the, the built environment can promote the values of these different contexts, sometimes imperfectly. In the area of privacy or information flow, the constraints imposed by constructed systems can be important to these social realms and the integrity of these social realms. So just to give um, a fairly superficial example, SSL, which is the secure socket layer, um, which allows us to um, provide our credit card without being afraid that when it's in transition, someone else will be able to steal it. You may say, okay, that, that protects the individual. Isn't that very good? It you know, protects our privacy. But I want to jump to the next layer of this argument and say, actually, it, prom it promotes a social goal as well, um, a robust marketplace, because it makes individuals much more willing to shop online. The Hippocratic promise never to break a patient's confidence is a hallmark of an ethical physician and it protects individuals from harm, but it also promotes societal health because individuals will share more freely the details of their health concerns and physicians will be able to do their jobs better. Education, and I've become really interested, how many of you have been reading all the news articles about MOOCs? Do you know what a MOOC is? Uh, Anyway, it's these, it was, it's these massive open online courses uh, that are, 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 are being taken by thousands and hundreds of thousands of students. But what has been really bone chilling to me is that these courses are, are, are able to detect what the, the student is doing on the other side of them. And as at this point, the kinds of privacy policies that are being discussed in relation to MOOCs are simply those as to between a, com a commercial entity and, and um, a consumer. And the, the issue here then is what becomes of education where individuals feel watched as they maybe are reading or writing drafts. Imagine if you had to hand in your totally messy draft to your professor. So the, the issue is not so much protection of the individual, but protection of, of an aspect of human life that is so dear to us. And I'd say in a, you know, in a school of architecture that values creativity, we want to understand what it, what's the best environment for that kind of creative thinking. So coming full circle in this delicate interplay between the shape of our built environment and social, political, and ethical values, it's important to recognize that the interconnections are complex and they're not always obvious. We focus too much on immediate impacts, say the surveillance cameras on, on individual behavior, often not recognizing that many other values are hostage to these design decisions. Individuals may normalize too quickly until we realize the scope of our losses. Thank you.
Right, okay. Cancel that. Okay, um, well, first, thanks, Kazis, for inviting me uh, to participate. Uh, it's certainly a humbling crew to be um, speaking with um, or amongst. Um, Kazis had asked me to present a current project, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, probably um, only use about 10 minutes. I want to you know, hopefully uh, use as much time as we can for our conversation, which is following this, because I think there are a number of issues which have been raised, um, which, um, particularly between these questions of privacy and, in particular, how it's constituted, right? What what constructs it in in vis-a-vis uh, -vis both architecture but also society collectively. Um, but the project I'm going to present is called uh, the Sentient City Survival Kit, and this comes out of a um, series of activities, initiatives, some of which Kaziz mentioned, um, um, which began with a symposium in 2006 at the Architectural League of New York, um, was evolved into a series of pamphlet-length publications, and ultimately led to an exhibition and a book on this notion of the sentient city. What is the sentient city? Uh, sentience is a way to think about um, this smart city that we're being promised by uh, the computer scientists and engineers. Um, um, but it's a way of thinking about it which doesn't necessarily ascribe um, some of the harder epistemological claims that um, are made in terms of artificial intelligence um, in particular. Um, so Sentient City, I like to say, is a city which um, can heal, hear, and feel things happening within it and around it, but doesn't necessarily know anything in particular about it. Right? Um, so it's not quite that smart city we're being promised, but it's not uh, that dumb either. So, as computing leaves the desktop and spills out into the sidewalks, the streets, the public spaces of the city around us, information processing literally becomes embedded in and distributed throughout the material fabric of everyday urban space. Um, pervasive or ubiquitous computing evangelists herald a coming age of urban information systems capable of sensing and responding to the events and the activities transpiring around them um, were, in a sense, asked to have faith in these systems that they are being designed for um, social good. Uh, imbued with the capacity to remember, to correlate, and importantly, to anticipate, uh, this so-called sentient city is envisioned as being capable of reflexively monitoring our behavior within it and becoming an active agent in the organization of our daily lives. Now, there's probably few of us who would quibble about uh, smart traffic light systems uh, that more efficiently manage the ebbs and flows of trucks, cars, and buses on our city streets. Uh, some of us will probably be irritated when discount coupons for our favorite espresso drink are based on the transaction history recorded through um, their use of a customer loyalty card, for example, um, are beamed to their mobile phone as they pass by a Starbucks. Many, however, are likely to protest when they're denied passage through a subway turnstile because the system somehow senses that their purchasing habits, mobility patterns, and current galvanic skin response reading, as measured by the metal turnstile bar, happens to match the profile of a terrorist. So in this project, the Sentient City Survival Kit probes the darker side of this emerging city, and it examines the implications for privacy autonomy, trust, and serendipity in this highly observant, uh, ever more efficient, and overcoated city. To the extent that business interests and government agencies drive these technological developments, we can s expect to see new forms of consumption and control emerge. In fact, um, we, in fact, already are seeing these emerge. Um, so here, in, in this project, in a sense, aims to propose alternate trajectories by which we might imagine the entanglements of technology and urban life in Tomorrow's City and looks toward a process of critical design, in particular the production of artifacts, as a way to imagine uh, this near future condition. Now I should say, when I speak about the near future, I'm talking about three to five years out, right? Now this is not the distant future. In a sense, this project um, was initiated in 2008. Um, I was at the time of visiting research in the Network Architecture Lab, in fact. And so in, a, in many ways, some of the things I'm going to show already have this strange echo between the time that they were conceived and um, what we're seeing around us, okay? So 
The survival kit consists of a collection of artifacts uh, for survival in this near future sentient city, and it takes as its method a critical design practice that looks toward archaeology for guidance. Now, archaeology involves the reconstruction of a world through fragments of artifacts, where past cultures are reconstituted in the present through specific uh, socializing and spatializing practices involving things like mapping, classifying, collecting, and, and curating. And cultural knowledge in this context is reproduced through relating in space and time the traces and remains of people, places, things, activities, and events. Um, in fact, Greg Stevenson has referred to an archaeology of the contemporary past as the design history of the everyday, where common objects drawn from daily life do not simply passively reflect cultural forces, such as trends in taste or fashion, for example, but also actively participate in shaping the evolving social and spatial relations between people and their environment. So my question was, really, what might it mean to create marked or unmarked artifacts for a culture located not in the contemporary past, but in the proximate future? How might we imagine future urban life from the fragments and traces of a society yet to exist? Um, I should emphasize that I'm less invested in predicting or forecasting uh, the future, but um, rather interested in working with the raw material of present day research located just upstream in the technology pipeline, such as that conducted in contemporary technology research labs, um, and designing artifacts, spaces, and media that tease out some of the latent biases, absurd assumptions, and hidden agendas at play in this research. So the design process then is not about designing applications for these technologies, but in a sense, developing implications of these emerging technologies. Um, so in a sense, it's, it's, it's about creating conversation pieces in the present around, around which we might organize a debate around just what kind of future we might want. And so like any good um, survival kit, it comes with a user's guide. And I'm just going to uh, walk through the items in the kit through this guide. Each one of the items comes with a story, a small design fiction. In this case, uh, in the near future, finding your way from point A to point B won't be the problem, uh, but somehow maintaining consciousness of what happens along the way might be more difficult. Uh, this alternative navigation app for mobile phones is designed to help you find something by looking for something else. Um, simply head out into the city and start the app. Um, it's a free app, which you, of course, would download from Apple's I Store, uh, uh, App Store. Enter, de enter a destination or let the app select one for you. And you can increase the uh, complexity of the route the app generates for you. Once you are happy with the route, tap start and you're on your way. Turn by turn directions from a web-based routing service, in this case, Google Maps API directions, um, are combined with instructions for movements and actions to take at each step of the way. Um, if you follow the instructions diligently, uh, you're sure to find small slippages and minor displacements within an otherwise optimized and efficient route between your origin and your destination. Um, the next item in the kit is um, called the RFID Under Aware. And in this case, uh, in the near future shopping center, item level tagging and discrete data sniffing will become both pervasive corporate culture, um, but also a popular criminal pastime. Uh, this popular product line consists of his and hers underwear designed to sense hidden radio frequency identification tag readers and alert the wearer to their presence. Small vib vibrating motors are sewn into strategic locations in the garments and are activated when the RFID, net, RFID antenna detects the presence of a reader nearby. Wear these garments while you are out and about to ensure that shopping remains a stimulating, if no longer secure, experience. Um, the ad hoc dark roast network travel mug. In a near future world where all network traffic is monitored via smart filters, where access privileges are dynamically granted and denied on the fly based on your credit card transaction history, and where bandwidth is a function of your market capitalization, standard commuter gear includes these travel mugs designed for creating ad hoc, 
ad hoc dark networks for communications along a morning commute. The mug incorporates a mobile phone screen embedded in the lid of the mug together with a small wireless mesh networking radio and microcontroller. Um, Caffeine-fueled commuters share short messages between them throughout the ride. Create your message by tapping the small dot on the side of the mug and then make a drinking gesture to broadcast it to other mugs on the network. <laughs> Others receive your message instantly and can respond in turn. The more mugs, the merrier, as each extends the network. A half a dozen mugs is enough to create a network along an entire train under normal conditions. The CCD Mina Umbrella. When human vision is no longer the only game in town, don't leave home without this umbrella it's studded with infrared LEDs designed to flirt with computer, computer vision algorithms running on advanced surveillance systems. The umbrella consists of 256 infrared LEDs inserted into its canopy, powered by eight lithium power polymer batteries concealed in its stock. These LEDs are visible only to CCD surveillance cameras set to infrared mode, uh, which is a night vision uh, mode. Um, these systems commonly track figures using a sophisticated algorithm to distinguish moving objects in the foreground of an image um, from a static background. By turning the umbrella on and off, you can alter the registration of foreground and background pixels stored in system memory, thereby frustrating attempts by the algorithm to track moving objects in the image. Um, I guess in closing, I should say that I'm less invested in predicting future trends in technology uh, than in creating concrete artifacts in the present around which we might organize a debate about just what kind of future we might want. Ultimately, again, the project seeks to address the implications, and by designing implications as opposed to designing applications, designing implications for privacy, autonomy, trust, and serendipity in this highly observant and ever more efficient and overcoated city. Thank you. I was hoping that we could spend about less than a half hour talking amongst ourselves. Thank you all for a fantastic presentations. I mean, they were all um, they were all just really, really, really great. Where to start? Um, somewhere in this in this blur that that, that seems to have emerged a few times. Uh, somewhere in these uh, in these positions. Um, It's interesting that you show that picture of Andy Warhol. That's from a, a book uh, called A Year in the Life of Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. And I, since I do some work with Johnson, as you know, I can't resist saying this, that um, David Dalton, who was an assistant of uh, Andy's, uh, writes in an introduction to the book that that is published in, um, called A Year in the Life of Andy Warhol. David Ma another David, David Maccabee, the photographer, had, um, was contracted by Warhol to take photographs of Warhol every day for a year. And Warhol goes to the glass house and with his entourage, and he wakes up there in, of course, the brick house, which is the opposite of the black house because it is a space of near total privacy. And they're both at the same time, they're they of a piece, and people always forget this. In fact, the glass house can't operate without the brick house because the brick house is where the, where the plant is, right? That's where, where the heating and, uh, uh, and it, it is for the, for the glass house, as well as where the plumbing comes from. So, he wakes up there and he looks out the little tiny porthole window and says, I feel like this is what it must feel like to be a Hollywood movie star. So, and there's a photograph of him through the porthole, so it's as if he's already on, t on a round TV. Uh, but then he goes, curiously, he goes to the glass house and among the individuals there is Bob Stern, Philip Johnson, David Whitney, a doctor whose name nobody can seem to remember. Um, and they're all, and as, as uh, Dalton recounts, um, they are all talking about 
the present. They're all talk. It's the reverse, maybe, of your project. They're all talking about the present. They're talking about Jackie Kennedy. They're talking. It's 1963 or 64. They're talking about very many current events. And but they're talking too fast, like I tend to. But they they talk too fast, and they're too agitated, and they're all dressed a little bit, not quite the way that Andy's crowd, of course, is, but just super hip, right? And Andy says, "This is." They suddenly realize that this is not. This isn't the present anymore, and that although they're talking about the present, this, these people are from a different era. And it's at that point that Andy one quashes the project by Maccabee and says, I can't have this kind of exposure. I can't have myself be distributed like this. I can't be seen like this. I can't have my image out of my control. He senses that Johnson is out of, Johnson's image is out of control. And for, in a sense it is, because Johnson for the next 10 years will disappear as if from the scene, as if from the televisual scene of architecture. Uh, until he comes back with the New York Five, with Eisenman and, uh, and Stern, actually, back in a different position. And Maccabee then um, doesn't know what to do. His, he publishes the photographs much, much later. But it's out, Andy, meanwhile, according to Dalton, who is his assistant at the time, at that point, Andy shuts down. It's at that, until that point, Andy had been engaging and open. Mm -hmm. And it's after that visit of going to the glass house that he takes on this persona of not just being Andy Warhol, but being Andy and pushing back. Mm -hmm. So it's as if the architecture, the architects, mm -hmm. and their overexposure, their lack of the ability to control themselves, their lack of ability to control their own image mm -hmm. properly is what he becomes concerned about. Well, and at the same time, I mean, you know, it's a fan fantastic story. I mean, I, I love every, every detail of it, but I mean, it would be uh, not right to say that architects don't control the image. That's precisely what they do. Oh, no, they, we are, do. they are experts on, on controlling the the image. And Johnson is a case in point. I mean, the way in which uh, he used this house from 1949, from the moment that uh, to build his persona is extraordinary and it's extremely sophisticated. And in fact, he uses uh, uh, that is also extraordinary coincidence, right? Well, it's not a coincidence, of course, but he uses television precisely. Uh, the media of television to um, to construct uh, his figure. People don't realize that uh, Johnson was so many times on television, like maybe 50 or more television programs. It's become the most fragile um, of all the the records, right? Because books are always in the library, but television studios throw away their uh, their their tapes. Right? All the way to the end of his of his life, he uses the house precisely to build his own um, uh, persona. Probably Andy didn't quite, I mean, at that point, probably didn't agree with this. Uh, but it cannot be said that he was out of control. Maybe maybe Stern was out of control, but Johnson was not <laughs> out of control. I don't think. <laughs> anyway. Um, and then, conversely, we have Edith Farnsworth, who acts as this individual who is concerned greatly about her privacy. Now, according to Philip Johnson, you know, this, he, uh, they were having an affair and she's just angry with him. Or well, not an affair, they were having a relationship and that this was common knowledge of the time. And she's angry with him and she just takes it out on him. And she does so by saying she's being overexposed, but she's being x-rayed. Yes. And yet she does so in an even more public venue, which of course she lives in the house, mm -hmm. you know, until, for, until I, I don't know if it was until her death or until very, very late, yes. until the 80s. She lives in it for a good 30 more years. Right. So she teaches that perhaps our clients can be smarter than the architects sometimes, or they can be very well aware of what we're doing, what they're doing too, um, and can get even with us in various ways. Um, but maybe thinking about that then, um, Helen, I was wondering, you know, and I don't know if you'd ever seen Mark's project before, um, I was wondering if both you and Beatrice might begin by responding to the kind of the provocation that, that Mark gave us uh, as an architect and also uh, as someone who hoped to, hopes to initiate conversations about these technologies. Um, I mean, I wonder, it's specific, I mean, I have some specific things I could, I could ask, but I think maybe I shouldn't. I mean, I'd like to just a little bit engage in this other conversation and then... Sure. Which is um, how we, we're looking at these historical cases of glass houses. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I imagine this to be the case, that there's certain 
let me call them visionary architects or visionary designers who try out certain things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these things catch on and the rest of society then adopts them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they just remain as they are, which is just one of a kind and an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. And nobody particularly goes there. So, uh, and, and in our dialogue, we talk about the Jenny Cam uh, maybe reality TV, Big Brother, and so on, these experiments in which we, in which individuals um, decide that they're going to expose themselves in every moment of their lives. And the, the, I just wonder how much can we infer about a culture in general or a trend in general or morality in general based on one or two. And, and the question is whether they're unusual freaks or whether they're the beginners of a trend. And I think that in, in this moment in time, maybe uh, some of you may have heard of 23andMe where you can send off and get your... Mine comes from. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, see here, you know, here's one freak or whatever. No, no, no. There may be one or two, there may be a yeah. number of... I'm sorry, that was really uncalled for. <laughs> but that's an appropriate. There may be a few people who may decide to do it, but one of the things that is important also to contextualize these activities is mm. also that the significant information only has meaning in in a context. And I use this word in the in its most general way. Mm -hmm. So we that glass house mm -hmm. may have a different meaning at that moment in time than the sort of spectacle may have at this moment in time. And your genome might be fine to display here where none of us can read it. But if as time goes on, we all have the capacity to read what this actually says about you. I think the re revelation of that information takes on another significance mm, what, sure. completely. And, and I mean, I think that maybe just to respond to that, because it, it actually has to, there are reasons, specific reasons why I did 23andMe that, and they had to do with these issues of context. When, um, when if, if you have a child at over age, 35 or so, or 34 or something like that today, you're almost mandated or at least very strongly advised to have genetic counseling. And we did genetic counseling uh, when, when we had our, our daughter and they said, you know, they looked at our genes and they said, you're fine, you're fine, nothing to worry about. And, okay, interesting, you know. And then, um, but then that was it. And what was interesting to me was they didn't reveal anything to me, right? They actually did, in fact, there, was, there are some interesting genetic conditions that, that one might be very interested in finding out about mm -hmm. before one might have a child. And yet, you don't find out, you can't find any of that out. That's, that's the property of the medical profession. In fact, in New York State, you can't do 23 me. It's illegal to do in, in New York State. New York State, you can do it, you can have your address here, but you can't mail the, the sample mm -hmm. from here, which is very strange. If, they, if it comes to the New York State postmark, they will throw it away because it's a New York State mm -hmm. law. So. And that leads to, yes, a question of context, but it leads to the other side, which is to who, who has access to our information and what can they do with it. Mm -hmm. um, do we, when, when Meyer and Whitfer did the League of Nations, they produced their competition entry for the League of Nations, they proposed to make a glass structure so that no backroom deals could be seen, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and, and yet Facebook, for example, is not, if you will, a glass information structure. Mm -hmm. They know what we have, but we don't know what they have. What they have. Right. Right. So, and with regard to the question of, uh, of whether these uh, houses are of glass are in the are some kind of uh, one-off eccentric architect reads, uh, uh, etc., is the dream of transparency is so persistent in architecture that is extraordinary. I mean, it's more. Uh, at that point, it's almost a century if you count the glass palace of, you know, 1850. So the dream of a hundred years of architects thinking about transparency, about ways in which you can see inside the building, we cannot discard, discard that. And the fact that it's still, to our time, we're still surprised by glass architecture, that it's still uh, uh, this piece that you send us from the New York Times, or, all the many articles about whether the standard is or the standard that. Uh, I mean, so we are still in, in many ways, uh, it, it, this architecture is part of our culture. We cannot 
deny uh, uh, that reality, right? So it's not, it's not so much the individual Farnsworth House or Glass Houses uh, of Johnson that matters. Is the is the persistence of the dream and the proliferation of it and the kind of democratization of it in already in the 1950s? No, it's not just the the Farnsworth House, but but the uh, Lexer Drive uh, apartments, which uh, you know in a way provide. It's, it's incredible when you look at it in in Life magazine. You maybe think about it with the standard, except that there nobody was surprised that nobody had curtains and that you could see every window with everything that was going on. And that, in fact, Miss have decided for whatever reason, which is also interesting, to put one tower and another one identical in front. So what else do you have to look at? But this reality TV television of your neighbor much more interesting <laughs> than the television of the 50s, I'm sure, right? So these at the same time of, of uh, uh, the television was uh, enter into the domestic space outside your vineyard. You have real telev reality TV, which will only come into television much later. So in a way, architecture anticipates the culture of our time as reflected in the m television program, for example. Yeah, Mies himself said that d did not live in the in, in 6880. He lived across the street. And when asked why, he said, "I can design those, but I'm not of this generation. I'm an old man. I cannot live there." Exactly. He also said that he didn't want to have people knocking at his door at 3 a.m. saying that their, that their toilet leaked. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, beyond that, there is also, as you pointed out, the picture, you know, for if we could say, and it isn't really that unusual, sort of the, the history, especially if you go to Chicago or, yeah, you know, yeah. look at the glass skyscrapers everywhere that follow in Mises' footsteps, yeah. or for that matter, the office buildings uh, in, New York, in any big American city of the era, but then also the picture window, as I think you correctly pointed out. I mean, the, the idea that one could see into the mm -hmm. suburban single-family home just as well as one could see out, right. because the picture is goes both ways. Right. I mean, this, and then it, of course, is cemented in the sitcom, where mm -hmm. the, it's as if you watch through the picture window. Mm -hmm. That is something that is, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's right. very common. Yeah. Now, of course, we have The Office, yeah. okay. where you have a TV show that has the presumption of there being, right. it being a reality show. Right, right, but they were not alarmed, and I think it's because they understood your very beautiful, I think, definition of privacy as yeah. the flow, or whatever it is, appropriate flow of information. Mm -hmm. So that I think is what they immediately understood in the 1950s that they were they were not exposing uh, uh, their right. privacy. In, in, right? in yes, and well, I mean, I wanted you then sort of take this to comment on Mark your one. Because I was really, uh, I loved the image of the people going through the um, subway turnstiles. Mm -hmm. Because we, we might think that the most shocking part of these buildings and facing each other and seeing everybody, you know, make, even if making a cup of coffee or whatever, what seems <coughs> innocuous. But on the other, but what we, we may say, oh, it's all fades in a blur and we get bored with uh, watching our neighbors make coffee. But um, what, what I think your art shows, it will pushes us to realize that, that there's a lot of this information that is gathered up and then makes a, differ a difference mm -hmm. in our lives and it might mean that we don't get led through into the subway. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think of that, that, I wish more people would. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I mean it's, a it's, it's, a, it's a complicated problem for architecture because it's not dealing with human vision. Like these sort of non-human vision systems, whether it's computer vision or it's mm, data mining based on mobility patterns, transaction mm -hmm. histories. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's hard for architecture to directly address that in the ways that you would say with a window and a curtain. But mm, at the same time, as, as, as you know, it has spatial implications. And so I think you know, the challenge is, is to try to understand it from the perspective of architectural space organization and programming in ways which open it up to speculation, imagination, reflection. Um, and that's, in a sense, what, you know, what I'm looking for you know, in working with these technologies. Well, you know, I always ask myself, well, what are the ar architectural implications here? You know, how can we tease them out? Yeah. Even if they're not you know, a kind of uh, agenda which, um, let's say, drives the development, but you know, potentially could um, allied it in some regards. Right. Yeah. But you're not saying that because it's not visual, 
It doesn't have architectural consequences, right? No, no, I wouldn't suggest that at right, all. Right, right. I mean, because so many of the things that you should that you that you suggest in your presentation, I think you, they have architectural implications. They're not necessarily uh, visual, and I think that's right. even more interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's you know, what I find is that you know, I wouldn't suggest that they don't have architectural implications. I would say that they're very challenging implications, right? And it's you know, how do you begin to sort of tease out and understand what that might mean? I mean, it's clear at the sort of urban systems level, right, in terms of organization, in terms of access, in terms of control and management, right? But at the building level, I mean, the question becomes, you know, in what way does this open up? Um, if we're talking about questions of privacy, um, and that has at least at one level to do with, um, you know, the, as you say, appropriate flow of information, mm -hmm. many of these systems are collecting information about us which not only do we not know about, but we can't even have access to. But so can can the house collect information yeah. about me and about people that are coming through the door that may be also important too, or at, you know alert you to certain things, or in the same way that in the city? I mean, why do you make? I mean, do you need to make the, that distinction between the mm. inside and outside? I think you could have extraordinary implications for what is an interior, what is privacy. Mm. How do we uh, uh, interact with our mm. with our spaces? Mm -hmm. No, that is true. I mean, particularly in terms of access, I would imagine. I mean, um, and you know, maybe the finer granularity of privacy versus privacy in mm -hmm. domestic space. Most of my work is focused on urban environments, and so I've right. not spent much time looking at uh, the domestic. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I just um, happened to for something that you. Uh, Mm -hmm. You passed on to me the legacy of the, the SH, uh, JSH media review editorship. I just reviewed a film, or I just had Owen Hatherley review a film that uh, Hydrin Holson did called Colonnade, mm -hmm. in which she, uh, she goes to the Colonnade apartments in Newark. People forget that there is a Mies building you could live in for just eight, nine hundred bucks a month in Newark. And it's right in this <laughs> film. I can't believe no, I don't, never heard of a student living there. I mean, it's Newark, but hey, mm -hmm. it's Mies. And it's, I mean, a fabulous film. Um, thank Felicity for having brought it here a while, uh, last year. But uh, what's, there are many very interesting things about it, but one of them is that there is, and it's never quite explained, there is a channel that you can tune on your TV that gives you the front door. Mm -hmm. And it's unclear to me as to whether this only emerges when somebody pushes the doorbell, but there's a man who seems to be just watching it all the time. And there's a constant discussion of this, that, yeah. you know, and, 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 of things like that, or yeah. the fact that people are also looking out from these glass building, glass windows and saying, one woman says, you don't need HBO here, you can see the police chases. Mm -hmm. And they, but it's fascinating, they all love Mies. And these are people who are, none of them are modernists, none of them are Dwell Magazine, these are people who are, you know, lower middle class or, or, yeah. or um, you know, not wealthy people, very diverse crowd. Yeah. But they all know who Mies is and they all love it. And they love this, various aspects and one of them is this kind of they can see who's coming in and they watch they just they just mm -hmm. sit there watching who comes in so perhaps we're perhaps we need to I don't I'm not saying Mies ever did that mm -hmm. it's just somebody else retrofitted it probably but is that but there are buildings like and there are places in a uh, in uh, also in uh, in in England right they had uh, in neighborhoods where you can watch your own CCTV in your neighborhood so then you can see who's going who's going to their house oh well they're going oh, Mm -hmm. Oop, that couple into that into the, that house that's a real problem you know is there, uh, sorry is there a political turn so maybe even architects are, are making observations like this about buildings is there a political turn that that goes from saying okay um, before the door someone knocked on the door mm -hmm. I had to open the door before I could see who that person was so there's like a, there's a certain power um, structure in that relationship mm -hmm. or the phone rings and I pick it up but I have to pick up the phone before I can know who it is now we have caller ID suddenly the power relationship shifts mm -hmm. because I can see who's calling me and I can decide not to answer the phone mm -hmm. with these capabilities like the glass the glass houses or the, the camera that shows you who's entering there's there's a it's not a major power shift, but it's a slight power shift. What I'm wondering, and it's like I'm asking you guys this yeah. question here, is whether architects, when you're involved in design or designers, whether that political thought 
-hmm. is whether you take that reasoning all the way to the political mm -hmm. conclusion of your design decision. Should we open it? I, think I, I would say absolutely, but for... maybe we should open it to the audience, both yeah, to respond to that <coughs> and also to guys. ask questions. <laughs> well, they may have other questions. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, super, super interesting stuff. Hey, uh, thanks. Super interesting stuff. This is really loud. Uh, talking about technology and, and privacy and, and things. Um, it's interesting, I mean, almost all of what what's we're discussing in terms of developments that are happening in the present day, um, you know, has, it was forecasted a long time before it happened. And certainly like um, the architectural discussion in the 60s with cybernetics and the possibility of, oh, we'll have all this information, the computer will process it. And it was generally, I think, a fairly utopian uh, tone, right? It, it, You'll have access to this information, you'll be able to control what happens in the building, you'll adjust this and that, it'll respond to you, and, and this will be really great. I think even if you read like Wired Magazine in the 90s, it would probably still basically read like that. Like all this, all this gathering of information will, will liberate us. Uh, and I feel like that tone has, has virtually disappeared uh, uh, as of this moment. I mean, the, the kind of need to produce new devices to just disrupt the uh, information network, which I thought was great, the umbrella. And, and I wonder if that, if that reflects some kind of Sort of speculate of why that would be, maybe just the kind of general awareness that uh, all the information is being gathered, um, it's going to be in the hands of people you know, that I can't get access to. And I think maybe the difference is the assumption always was in the utopian projects, you would have access to all the information and that would kind of make it okay. And I, I don't know if that's just disappeared, if we've given up on that completely, we don't care. Um, I mean, it, it'd be interesting to read like Anytime the, the privacy things come up on Facebook, there's always the person who posts back and says, yeah, I know they're gathering it, and I've just sort of resigned myself to that. That's fine. Um, I'd, rather, I'd rather have Facebook and not have privacy than, than give up Facebook. And, and you know, maybe that's, is that a generational thing? Is that just the way things are now and it's, that's not gonna go back? You know, how, how I think the, the most interesting thing to me was the question raised at the very beginning about you know, what, what is this thing we call privacy? What, why do we assume that that's a uh, a natural thing that's opposed to public, uh, as opposed to just kind of uh, a constructed thing that, that constantly changes its definition. I'm sure it was a different definition a thousand years ago. Um, so that's not really a question, but maybe just an um, uh, invitation to, to speculate on, on, on those changes and, on, and such. On the question of privacy, I think it's really, really interesting the way in which we have changed our understanding of what private is, because we, you know, at some points, we may have said, or something, somebody may have said something about privacy having to do with walls. Well, that's a very precise historical moment in which privacy <laughs> was defined by walls with the invention of the, of the corridor. Have you read this beautiful article of uh, Robin Evans, which is called Figures, Doors, and Passages, right? Where he goes back to, to the Renaissance and other times, and you know, people will pass in palaces through. Uh, rooms and rooms where people will be sleeping or making love or going to the bathroom and nobody, nobody felt that their privacy was being disrupted in any way. Privacy was something else, right? So this coincidence of privacy with being <laughs> coinciding with, with a wall is a very, very limited time and there is no reason uh, uh, to think that whatever we think of privacy now will continue in the, uh, in the future. So is this thing, for example, of this is the way it is right now? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, the uh, latest research says that the new, the youngest generation is already using Facebook in completely different uh, ways, and they may not have actually any use for fa Facebook uh, the way it exists right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's continuously evolving, and it has consequences, of course, in in architecture. Or maybe architecture is first, I don't know, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> when I think about this thing of me anticipating, in a way, um, the reality of, of our time, so or, or the architects of the 50s are anticipating the exposure, the overexposure, the hyper-public condition of our time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I'd like to maybe just add you know, that I think one of the things we're seeing is many of these technologies are in a sense grow growing up and in the process of them doing, um, they break down from time to time or privacy policies shift, let's say on Facebook and suddenly um, status updates are exposed and you know, there's a big 
to do in the media about that. Um, so, you know, when, when these systems fail, they start to reveal something about the way that they work, and to a certain extent, their frailty, right? Um, you know, you have a very direct control over opening a window or closing a curtain, right? But you have less control over, you know, Mark Zuckerberg deciding that they want to rework the privacy policy. And as a result, because some coder was, um, you know, not doing his due diligence, certain things became public, right? Which, in a sense, were never intended to. So I think moments like that open up questions about um, and these systems in ways which, which are, um, you know, potentially um, directly related to the evolution of these technologies. The other thing I wanted to say that in the context of um, visuality and uh, the ability to see in the context of transparent surfaces, um, you know, I think often about, you know, I've, I've spent a bit of time in, in Rotterdam and um, the Dutch have a very interesting relationship to this notion of the curtain, which is essentially they don't use them. And you know, if you start to speak to them, and this is just based on anecdotal conversations, um, but if you start to speak to them, you find out that, I mean, in a sense, it's this Calvinist notion that, of course, I don't use my curtain because I'm not doing anything inside my own space that I would hide from you. Right? So I think you know, the fact that this is also a kind of cultural condition that privacy concerns are, are very different, let's say, in the United States, um, than they are in other places around the world. Um, for example, there's a reason why New Songdo, which is a um, ubiquitous city, smart city being built in Korea, is being built there. In part, if you read some of the early um, 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 presentations of that project, it's in part the fact that in South Korea, the concern about privacy is nowhere near the same as it is here in the US, right? So I think you, know, you have to understand these flows of, you know, the, the appropriate flows of information in relationship to, well, yeah. <laughs> you have to understand it yeah, in relationship to who's regulating that information, right? And in what degree to, can you trust it? So when, when it fails, when it doesn't. Let's have another question. Yeah. Hello. Um, I, was, I was hoping you could uh, speak to this topic in the context of urban versus rural. Uh, and uh, mm. for me, uh, exhibitionism and voyeurism are inherently uh, city characteristics. Uh, and peepers and flashers are sort of a product of, of the urban condition. And um, as we all know as the cities, or as the world is becoming more and more urbanized, more people are flocking to the cities, living on top of each other. How, what, what are the societal implications for privacy in that context if we're changing the way? I could speak of urban and suburban, and that mod it makes me think of Mata Clark, who's jo who advocated living in the city without curtains as being a place where you're on display and under exposure. And that being a healthy lifestyle, of course, Mata Clark, if you know him from his videos, he liked to take a shirt off and, and a uh, muscular guy, very attractive. And then, but he, he liked to do that while cutting apart suburban homes because they were not, they did not have, they did not put the inhabitants on display. They didn't, they, they, you hid away in them. And so the question is, would we still do that? I mean, my, my question is, though, would we still do that today? Does the urban, does the urban permeate the rural? Uh, uh, the mentality of their, you know, in, a, in a world that is primarily urban now, are we just all flocking to cities? Or are we also, is, the, is life outside of the city core taking on those values as well? Um, that would be my question. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it gets a little bit to when it's sort of just for fun, think of as a disagreement about um, privacy in Japan. Because, uh, um, and in fact, I had a student working with me on this. Uh, the Japanese, so the story goes, there's actually no word for privacy in Japan. They use the, what's, what's it when you, what's the name when you, when you take, the, it's privacy or something like that. They, they don't. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, what we did is we looked at these very ancient texts, and of course, they always um, 
rules about who should be in the room when a woman is having a baby. They, they, they're always expect and that it's wrong to gossip or um, if you're a stranger in a town, you must cover your face. There are always these rules that um, constrain the way information flows. And because Japanese homes, the walls are not thick walls, so you can hear through them, there's this notion that you have to act as if you are not, as if you don't know. So even if you heard, you have to act as if. And I think that it sort of blends into your question about urban environments because I often think that people who live in a, in a, in a place like New York actually are very good at acting out privacy. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, they're very good at, you know, not if you're in a subway or whatever, not making that in your face kind of gesture. Mm. Which suggests to me that there are different ways of acting out privacy, you know, in different conditions, in different cultures. Mm -hmm. Even though it may look as if there is no privacy in an urban setting, but we adapt to these conditions in different ways, which su suggests that there are these expectations that we have, but we act them out differently. Mm -hmm. I like this thing of the acting. Privacy. I had a friend when I came to, to New York who lived in the, in the village in the, on the ground level and the only way to get uh, light was actually to have the, the curtains always open and I asked her, you know, what, you know, how did she feel about it? And she said, oh no, I mean, I, you know, I, I act every day for all these tourists that pass around here. <laughs> so she enacted her <laughs> private life, never felt that, you know, in any way she was uh, exposing. It's curious this question of privacy. I wonder how they translated my book into Japanese because they never raised the issue, but the French did raise the issue because the word doesn't exist in, Fran in, French, in French either, which made me think about how to translate privacy and, pub and publicity and actually ended up with a title that was closer to what the book says, which is not an opposition between privacy and publicity, but it says something like the publicity, because publicity they have, the publicity of the private. So the private exists, but privacy doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's just a, it's also a question of um, of let's say design. In uh, in 2006, when I was at the Annenberg, which isn't very long ago, uh, Mizuko Ido, who's a brilliant anthropologist and and, stud and who studies Japanese uh, uh, teen culture and also tele telecommunicational culture, and who just truly expert in many things. Every now and then she would get something wrong, unfortunately. I would get things wrong all the time. She would get things wrong every great now and then. And one thing she said was that Americans, unlike the Japanese, you know, don't really have a need to text. In Japan, of course, you, you text because you're on, mm -hmm. on the train and it's not considered polite to be you know, talking on your phone in public. And she said she didn't think Americans were ever going to, going to take up SMS texting within a year. Yeah. Suddenly, there are the design barrier of actually the text, the text message is not communicating properly, like the SMS systems didn't communicate properly to each other, fell, and now everybody texts all the time and nobody uses their cell phone. Yeah. So, so sometimes it is a question, of course, of design and an affordance that, that we can relate to. I want to have one last question from, uh, from David in the back. Thanks. Um, so I'm just thinking back to privacy and publicity, um, and the sort of, the going back to the notion of the mask, and even to Nietzsche and Loos, mm -hmm. and um, sort of considering the, the sort of the different strategies that have been outlined about how um, we address the flow of information across the boundaries, I'm wondering um, if what we're seeing is sort of the dissolution of interiority, in that, um, when you have the x-rays and the, and the glass houses and now you have these various, you know, th this idea that there's no privacy but instead it's all just degrees of publicity. Um, I'm wondering, like, you have, you have the x-ray, you have sort of the potential of obfuscation um, and you have the sort of dissolution of the sort of coherence of information. So I wonder if, if we're now in a stage of filtering or, you know, what, what's, is there any inside left or is it just a matter of degrees? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just maybe quickly, I'd like, just like to say that in you know the content, and I think Alan, you raised this in your talk that you now this 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 move to overcompensate in terms of the publicity um, 
And, you know, sometimes I, I wonder to what degree that, you know, the, um, to the extent that one is carefully crafting this public persona uh, is actually a strategy to um, protect the kind of private or interiority. It's yeah. a question. I'm not, I, yeah. I don't know. The, the other aspect, you know, to me is whether or not that, um, you know, this question of filtering, right, um, suggests that we're, we're really not talking about the public anymore, but we're talking about multiple publics, right? which is to say that, you know, we have different groups, we have different circles, which whether it's circles in Google+, Plus or it's you know, different friend groups in Facebook, which we share things with. And we share certain things with, let's say, our colleagues, uh, we share other things with our family, we share other things with um, our neighbors in our co-op, for example. Right? Um, but this notion of a kind of unified public, I think, is something which, which is changing. And you know, it would be interesting to see how, how that in and of itself plays out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm pessimistic about um, the capacity of the individual, in any event, to effect the kind of filtering that you may think would be useful because, and I mean, this actually gets to the point you were saying about how we see the dark sides of data. I mean, you go to Stern Business School and probably the Columbia Business School, you go to um, this, any of the scientific departments who are really absolutely enthralled with big data, and um, they, it's just, that's how knowledge is going to come to us. And so you may try to create these filters, but big data is seeing you for what you really are, no matter what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's, and there's huge excitement about it. There's huge, there's huge excitement about the positive impact of it. And I think that those of us who are concerned about what this means are just struggling Mm. to conceptualize it mm. and um, these efforts are, are just small ways of dealing with something very large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, I mean, I'm also pessimistic, but I, going back to, to your question, I suppose we are in a, in a, in a situation in a way similar to that uh, described by Simon at the beginning of the 21st 20th, 20th century, no? never has an individual been in the presence of so many people uh, they don't know at all and being forced physically to be so close to them that the new strategies have to be devised to protect one's mm -hmm. privacy, the kinds of things that we now do without thinking in the subway when you are with all these faces here and you, okay, you read a, your book or you look somewhere else but you definitely don't make <coughs> eye contact. I suppose that with uh, new technologies, we are in, you know, this is, uh, I suppose, a, a, a very important uh, question that will not have an answer right away, but I think this is what, uh, what kind of a mask is, is protecting us, or what, what, what kind of mechanisms we devise to protect ourselves in this situation. I think these are the questions of, of our time, and I, I think it's, it's extremely important to understand that architecture is a crucial part of that, uh, of that, uh, of that process. Yeah, I, mean, I get curious, the iPod is perhaps the, the marker of the 21st century, right? Developing in 2001 to protect us in the subway. In fact, immediately released, the first major consumer device released after 9-11. Maybe, but you know, when I arrived here, Sony had introduced, in New York, Sony had just introduced the, the, the Walkman, mm -hmm. and everybody was using it in, in the subway. It was like the greatest yeah. thing, because it was this tiny thing, and with the thing, you don't hear anything, and, and you isolate yourself. As opposed so, to the boombox. So, so, exactly, so it creates a space, the space of sound, which is a yeah. space, even if there's no, no work. So again, we go back to the question of how many boundaries establish privacy that are not necessarily physical. Yeah. Sound establishes boundaries too. Right? I think we should head off to dinner and let, let our, our, our audience free as well. Thank you all.